Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Sham Ashram in Kali, Colombia, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show and welcome to beautiful Kali, Colombia, and welcome to Walk on Wednesday, where today we pick one of our audiences, we pick somebody out of the audience and we sort of pick their brain, hear their story, tell, you know, just hang out with them for about five, five or ten minutes or so, and today we have a special guest who's from Jersey City, Jersey, but has taken residence here in Cali, Colombia by a very roundabout route. His name is Sri Govinda. Welcome, Sri Govinda. Very cool. Thanks so with this me. microphone, you got to stick your muzzle right in this mic, okay? So we're going to get really close, right. make friends here. Yeah, we're, we're, pretty we're pretty close anyway. <laughs> so Sri Govinda has a very interesting story, how he got, how he sort of dove into bhakti. And it's... Uh, you know, sometimes our stories are both, you know, exciting, sometimes uh, scary, tragic. But, you know, one of the big inspirations for me was the loss of my father. So it's not like a, it's not like a great story, but it's a, it's a real story. And uh, your story is very real. And uh, one thing I really admire you is you're a person who's like very focused. And in the material world, you had a lot of material success due to that focus. But I also see that in your spiritual life. You're a very focused person. It's a qualification to sort of evolve on any path, be it material or spiritual. What's your story? What's my story? Um, well, uh, I was I was leading the typical American life, following the dream. Got the big house, the wife, VP at a good bank. Everything was going right according to plan. Uh, and then in 2008, uh, we had our first child, Benton, a uh, beautiful little boy, <clears throat> um, first son in my family, and uh, my dad, everybody was ecstatic, and um, we were just planning it all out, and everything was going just like you planned. You know, I was putting the money away for college, everything was going to be on track. And then um, when Ben was seven months old, he started to develop um, a little rattle in his eyes, and we didn't know what that was. Uh, <clears throat> and then we found out that um, he had a very rare illness uh, that only 16 kids a year get. Uh, he was born with it, called Tay-Sachs, uh, which we learned was <clears throat> terminal. Uh, anyway, so we, uh, we started to figure out how, to, how do you deal with a child that's basically got three years to live and how do you care for that child and um yeah so we we just uh we did everything we could to take care of him and uh take care of ourselves and uh the problem with the illness is is that you find out that slowly uh when most babies reach milestones uh ben would lose milestones mm. uh but the one thing he didn't lose was his hearing. So I got lucky. Uh, somebody gave me a CD of uh, some Krishna Das um, Kirtan. And it was the one thing that whenever I played it, 
Um, if he was upset or crying, he would right away stop. Uh, so I just started playing kirtan. And I kind of figured out that there would be things that, you know, eventually he wouldn't be able to do. Um, he would lose his vision. Uh, he'd lose his ability to move. But, but he could hear and he could feel. So I could always hold him and, and I could sing. And, sorry. <laughs> and that was our bond. That was our connection. So in uh, January 2013, uh, Benny passed away. He was three and a half. Um, he had a very peaceful passing. That whole week we had friends singing kirtan from California and around the world. And, uh, and he was effulgent at his passing. Can I ask you a question? Please. So when you said in your in, in kirtan, did you like you were into like a bhakti or Eastern spiritual thought yeah. or it was like you just like kirtan music and he liked the, the child like kirtan music or, you know, one of the things you taught me and I, I kind of figured out, too, was that you didn't even have to know what you were saying. You just knew how you were feeling. Mm. And I think that kirtan came to me through yoga and I started getting into kirtan more and more. More, and I became friendly with Guravani, with Jayutal, and with many of the Kirtanias that would come through New York. And, and Kirtan became my outlet because our days were 18 hour days. You know, Benny couldn't sleep well at night. We had to move him, we had to turn him, we had to suction, we had a lot of things. And I was working and caring for my wife and my parents and my family and myself. But Kirtan was the outlet. It was without knowing, without understanding what I was saying, you just felt something. And, and obviously he did. Mm. And um, I think if there was anything I was quickly able to learn was that not everything is so rational. You know, sometimes there's just something that happens, something that you just feel, and you just can't explain that. Um, and then after he passed, I didn't know what to do. You know, we, I grew up Jewish. My wife at the time was Catholic, my ex at the time. And, um, but that was another weird thing, like, you know, you don't really know as a parent, you never think that you're going to have to plan your child's funeral before he dies. But we did, and we decided that I didn't want to put him in a grave. I decided that, you know, she would end up going to the grave all day, and that wouldn't be good. So we decided to cremate then without thinking that that would be an Eastern thing, just smarter for us. Mm. But then I didn't know what to do with the ashes. And then um, a few years later... I met a friend who invited me to a flight school yoga class or whatever. Oh, what was that? Arm, arm balancing yoga class. And, and I walk in and then there's this crazy guy there screaming and getting me up into handstands and telling me all these things. And, and before I know it, I'm sitting with him by the harmonium and he's chanting and he's telling beautiful stories of Krishna. And my heart just broke open and, um, and we just hang out. And then a few weeks later, um, my friend Erica says to me, hey, he's doing another trip to India. You got to go. And I'm like, India? I'm like, no way. <laughs> and then I just think about it. And I say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go to India with this guy. And then I'm up at, uh, I'm with Gurvani one time. And it was actually Bar who starts telling me the story of how in India they put the ashes of, of the deceased in the Ganga. So I called Gurvani. I said, you know, Gurvani said, I'm going on this thing with Raghu in September, and I'd really like to bring some of Benny's ashes to the Ganga, but do you think he could help me? Because I don't know, you know, what do you do? And Gaur's like, yeah, let me write to Raghu, and you'll talk to him. Sure, he's going to help you. And I'm like, look, I don't want to throw things off at this pilgrimage. Just maybe he could set me up with somebody, and I'll go off to the side and do it quietly. And... Um, and then we end up coming to India together. And, you know, well, can I tell you, if you haven't been to India with Raghunath, um, you'll never stop going if you do. And um, we end up being with a great group. You know, in the, um, the, the putting the ashes of your son in the river was like such a like, was such a powerful part of the trip because it's that 
part of pilgrimage is not just the joy and the fun and the adventure of it. It's like the sobriety of it. And I think that's a, that sort of the beauty of, of bhakti is, you know, we get accused often. People on a spiritual path get accused of sticking their head in the sand when it comes to life. But I don't I see that completely the opposite. I don't believe we're sticking the head. I think we face the real challenges of life. What are the challenges of life? Disease. We're going to get old. We're going to die. Those are the big challenges. Everything, everything else isn't a challenge. Everything is just like a some little petty thing that's happening that I'm putting at the forefront of my mind. And I think uh, even though like we laugh during the show, we joke a lot and, we, you know, uh, there's like on pilgrimage, there's adventure. We never stray away from the fact that our time here in this encasement is just for a few days, a few months, a few years. And I think it that that little ceremony we had for the passing of your son at the Ganga it was incredibly beautiful, sobering. And it's those questions. It's those times that bring out the real why the big why questions, the big why. Why am I here? What the hell am I doing here in this world? Life is ticking by. People I know have died, have passed away here. Your son has passed away. Even people hearing this, by the way, if you didn't pick up on this, we're in the, a yoga retreat here in Kali, Colombia. So there's a whole group of students with us today. But even just hearing this story, it's like, OK, here's this nice guy. He's been very charming and very fun and very fun to be with. And he's got this backstory. He's got this very materially tragic backstory. And that's another beautiful part of Bhakti is things that are materially tragic can somehow be spun into a trampoline of your spiritual life. And that's exactly, I feel like what you did. And once you started to get hook it, hooked in with like your spiritual practice, you just accelerated on it. And uh, I've, I've been really like, if I may say proud, but just inspired, inspired in like all your choices that you've done. Well, you put me on a good path, my brother. And uh, Rob has been a great mentor to me, a great yeah. friend. And through you, I met Kastuba G. And, you know, we were we were together in India when Rob and I were walking to the waterfall. And he starts telling me about this thought he has of starting this super soul farm project. And then we get back to New York and you call me with Moga G. And you're like, can you come up and check out this farm? And you know, we stay overnight, we take a walk and he's like, we got to get some people together. We want to, we want to do a whole project here. We want to bring Bhakti here. And, you know, we want to, we want to give a pilgrimage experience in the U.S. to people that aren't on pilgrimage. We want them to come back and get pilgrimage. And that and, was an, in, in Sri Govinda was a huge part of uh, uh, the Super Soul Farm and getting it off the ground and organizing it and, uh, started a board. Yeah. And before we knew it, we were in mid-March ripping up, uh, sheep dung from the floor of a, a garage and uh alexandra mog and i are designing a hardwood floor on the phone with uh herringers or whatever the, yeah, what was yeah. the name of that yeah. wood place and, and there we are with a team of people with a stove laying a floor and starting it was beautiful it was, it was, it was beautiful exciting yeah. yeah well thank you prabhu we appreciate your vulnerability and your thank story you. and so glad to be here I'm now excited to be with you i'm ecstatic to be with all of you and I'm ecstatic that you and Kastuba G and the team are, and Mara are doing such amazing stuff and we're ecstatic to host your Wisdom of the Sages retreat here at Kali Ashram with Shama Sundari who is my better half thanks to Raghu and Kastuba and she will be here next week I think maybe to walk on and give you guys a little story but uh, please thank you for coming on thanks Prabhu I owe you everything thank Hare you Hari Bol everybody thank you Woo. what a story huh that's, yeah, it's an amazing story. You know, beyond that, um, Sri Govind is on the board of directors at the Bhakti Center. And just yeah. super positive, super responsible, super qualified. He, he's, he's, um, he, he's just a great, great, great soul. I really love Sri Govindaji. Yeah, me too. Me too. So anyway, we got 101 people here on Zoom and a big gang of people here. And... Uh, We got, what do you call it? We got the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 1. And we are on the lovely text. We're dealing with, dealing with pride today, Kastuba. That's the big, big thing, pride. pride. Okay. That's the theme of the day. It's a, it's, a, it's a sinkhole in our spiritual practice, pride. Right? It can pride be. of wealth. Pride, what, what, what are they? Pride of wealth, pride of 
Well, why don't we do our mantras and then we'll read the verse and I'll come up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's dive in. Narayanam namaskritya naram chayva narotamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tatojaya mudiraye. Before we start in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being. Unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Priyeshva Badreshu Nityam Bhagavat Sevaya. Bhagavati Uttamash Loke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki. By regular attendance and classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart will become eradicated and loving service to the Supreme Lord who is, tra who is praised with transcendental songs will be established in the heart as an irrevocable fact. Om Gyana Tamarandasya Gyana Anjana Salakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tazmai Sri Maha I offer my respectful obeisances unto my spiritual masters who have opened my eyes, with the, uh, which were blinded by the darkness of ignorance, with the ointment of knowledge. Hmm. All right. All right. Okay. We are on uh, Canto 43. Yeah, we're text 43. You know, in text 42, we had Vidura, who was, uh, now he's talking to Uddhava this super intimate close associate in devotee of krishna he's unique he's special he's like really really deep you know as deep as it gets and um and vidur is sharing that um he, he he was inquiring he he inquires from vidur about krishna's family his own family because uh, he's been on pilgrimage for so long now and uh, he mentions, you know, he goes through all the different family members, and then he mentions his own brother, Dhritarashtra, right? That um, the blind king, you know, he kicked me out, you know, uh, banished me, you know, just because he couldn't listen to good advice and listen to his evil sons, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm just his well-wisher. I, I don't, you know, I don't feel any negativity towards him, you know. And I'm not astonished that this happened. You know, and it's it's funny, right? Because like sometimes if we're mistreated, we say, "I can't believe this." <laughs> you, know, right? you ever say that? I can't believe. Who does he think he is? I can't believe well, how this. How dare he? Yeah, but but he's saying the exact opposite. I, I can totally believe it. I expect because I because especially since I've been traveling around the world and and I've been watching people and I've been seeing how the Lord's illusory energy affects people. I, I and I, I'm just that's what happens in this world is people become bewildered. So why should I? Why should I be bewildered that sometimes I'm going to be unfairly treated? That's the way that this world works, you know? Yeah. Why um, hate or despise? Yeah. Well, right. and then he says, you know, uh, he, he, he says that, but, but um, I'm not bewildered because I know, he says, the activities of the personality of God, which are like those of a man in this mortal world, are bewildering to others. But I know of his mm. grace. I, I know of his greatness by his grace, and thus I'm happy in all respects. So once I stopped just kind of like fighting for my piece of the pie, you know, like, you know, working hard for material enjoyment, trying, you know, trying to enjoy materially without understanding spiritual life. Once I began to more deeply contemplate and understand my connection to God and to all that is, to the root of all existence and understanding that my happiness isn't coming from anything external. I don't need to compete for it and fight for it or feel offended or, or any of that. Then I became happy in all respects. You know, So the real mm -hmm. happiness isn't dependent on anything external, but it's, it's something that uh, he just had to come in touch with again. And then we come up to today's verses, text 43. Text 43. So now he's he's speaking about how Krishna appears in the these last few verses. There's only three verses left to this chapter. We can finish it up today. But uh, they they talk about how Krishna appears in this material world. Why he does? Despite his being the Lord, and being always willing to relieve the distress of the sufferers, he Krishna refrained from killing the Kurus, although they committed all sorts of sins and although he saw other kings constantly agitating the earth by their strong military movements carried out under the dictation 
of the three kinds of false pride. Mm -hmm. It's intriguing. Three <laughs> kinds of false pride. Yeah, three kinds of false pride. So he's saying that um, there's, you know, if we go back to Mahabharata and Bhagavatam, you know, there's in both these it'll be described that the earth was suffering, right? The whole Mahabharata begins there, right? Mother Earth. Mm. Mother you Earth told that story yesterday in Sweet Baby Krishna. Did you? The suffering earth comes yeah. to the form of a cow and then approaches the demigods and then approaches Lord Brahma and then they approach Brahma approaches Vishnu. We talked about the descent of Lord Krishna, the descent of Lord Krishna. So we're right there again. It's a Krishna miracle. We're right. We're right back here. Mm -hmm. Told the story of the killing of Putin too. That one never gets old. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, the earth is feeling burdened, feeling pain, right? Because of all of these horrible leaders, <laughs> right? That's, you know, horrible men that are, and here it's being said that they, that they're under the control. They're always men too, isn't it? They're always men. Horrible always. leaders are always men. Yeah, you're, you're are, there any, are there any horrible women leaders? <laughs> there have yeah, been, okay. but especially it's men. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so, so, um, it's, she said, you know, these, these horrible men that they think they're in control, right? They put on a show like they're in control. They're under the illusion that they're so powerful. Really, they're yeah. puppets, right? And they're, 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 they're controlled by this illusory sense of false pride. Three kinds of false pride are, are mentioned here. And uh, uh, Prabhupada will mention in the commentary. I, I can read a little bit. He said, yeah. um, let me make sure I got the right one. Okay. He says, godless kings or heads of state, when puffed up by advancement of material wealth, education, and increase of population. These are the three, right? So you could say wealth, education, and followers, right? So wealth, God, yeah. Wait, these are the things that people are proud of? These are three forms of false pride that are being mentioned here, yeah. All right, let's what's, let's, what's let's memorize them too. Okay, memorize. wealth. I can get that. Wealth. People w get proud of their wealth. E F. Wef. Wef. Wealth. Okay. Education. That's an acronym. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a memory. People get proud of their device. education and they're very smart. I get that. Okay. What's the third one? Here it says uh, increase the population, but in other places it says followers. So you can say followers. Right? Like like fame or becoming popular, validation in the material world. Yeah, and I think also even just like you know the the size of your army or whatever you know the, okay. the population okay. of your country, right? So wealth, education, and followers. Godless kings or heads of state, when puffed up by advancement of material wealth, education, and followers, always make a show of material of I'm sorry of military strength, mm. and give trouble to the innocent. Right. We see it happen all the time. Sure. When Lord Krishna was present. All the time. <laughs> when Lord Krishna was personally present, there are many such kings all over the world. And thus he arranged for the battle of Kukshetra. So what happens is Mother Earth comes. She says, I'm suffering. These horrible leaders, they're just, you know, they're, 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 I can't bear it. And, um, you know, and generally we see those leaders abuse the earth in different ways, especially nowadays. So uh, Krishna says, Lord, you know, Lord, she says this to Lord Brahma, that Lord Brahma with other devas, they approach Lord Vishnu and they get the mm. response that, okay, we're all going to appear and we're going to rid the earth of this burden. And that's the battle of Kurukshetra or the Bhagavad Gita leads up to, right? Where Arjuna has to enter this battle. And so it's saying here that this whole battle was kind of an arrangement of Krishna to relieve the earth of this heavy burden. You get all these horrible leaders together and you let them kill mm. each other. Right. And Arjuna, his devotee, kind of takes the credit. So the, it, later in the purport, Prabhupada writes, the Lord always wants to see his devotee as the hero of some episode which he himself performs. Th this is describing why Krishna just didn't wipe them all out himself or something. He, he actually arranged in a way where his, the devotee that he loves can become the hero. He wanted to see his, his devotee and friend Arjuna as the hero of the battle Kukshetra unless he waited for all the miscreants of the world to assemble. That and nothing else is the explanation for his waiting, which is kind of a... It's almost like the origins of the hero's journey or something, like the idea of like the hero wins and he saves saves lives or sa sa saves us all. 
it's like, you know, when you write a classic story, you have the hero's journey. And so um, you fall in love with all these people. You fall in love with the people who do good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it becomes like a uh, sort of like a beacon of light for everybody. Every kid growing up in India or now people all over the world, they read the Mahabharata and they look up to these, the Pandavas mm-hmm. or Arjuna. Especially and they Arjuna. set the stage standard of how to behave you know how how to think how how to speak yeah it's almost a side note here you got any shortcuts for dealing with this pride me i don't know if i have any shortcuts no but i'm just going to mention it's it's almost a side note here that this is just kind of reveals something about krishna's heart because you know the lord always wants to see his devotee as the hero of some episode which he himself performs now generally we want to see ourselves promoted as the hero, right? What to speak of it's something that we mm. do ourselves, you know, hey, that was me, <laughs> you know, like I should be getting the credit for that. And it's saying right here that the mm. supreme being, the origin of all, the, 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 that being where there's no question of that being being an illusion, derives happiness, not from self-praise, right, or being praised himself, but by but he feels the, the deepest happiness by seeing the one that they love be glorified. And it's very interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a clue. You know, it's a clue to what is the formula for happiness in life. Right? You could say godly happiness is, is taking happiness in the glorification of others. It, you know, when you hear about these things, Kastub, yeah. Cool. You want to finish? You well, I was just going to say, I was going to segue something? into um, uh, that, which is kind of the opposite of pride, right? Which we can maybe get into more now, but oh. please go ahead. Right. In other words, pride means, you know, like, well, I, I was going to say, glorified. we've been reading about this stuff like yesterday was like anger and how anger controls one and basically sort of kicks our consciousness down the stairs. Just, it leads to bigger and bigger and grosser and grosser, like uh, illusion. And now we're talking about pride. So, Mm -hmm. you know, in Bhakti, it seems like when they bring up these things, pride, uh, arrogance, uh, illusion, lust, it seems like, are are we supposed to like wrestle with each one of these like mental demons one-on-one? Um, or is it the practice itself starts to slowly take dismantle them? Mm. You know, what would you answer that? Because it seems like, okay, I got to deal with lust. Okay, I got to deal with anger. Okay, I got to deal with pride. Yeah. Well, you know, how do you answer that to somebody? There are different types of yoga, right? So some, some, I think in some yogas, you would be trying to dismantle those intellectually. You know, you would combine that with a, with a, um, a practice of like, you know, renunciation, maybe, maybe intense renunciation. And then intellectually, you would try to, you know, anal- within your mind, kind of like disassemble all of those uh, shortcomings intellectually, mm. right? Um, what am I being proud of? You know, am I proud of my body? I'm not my body. My body is a temporary, you know, uh, a form, you know, that is ultimately unreal because it comes together just for a moment and, you know, and then disperses. What am I proud of? I, I have no connection to that. Remove that pride. You know, there's like an intellectual way to do that. And, and the bhakti yogi is, is welcome to engage. It's helpful to think that way and all. But in bhakti yoga, our primary thing, and we can just see here like Krishna, he's thinking, I want Arjuna to be glorified. And he finds his happiness in that. And, and for the devotee, the idea is that when we, when we actually develop, like you were having sweet baby Krishna readings yesterday, you know, it's through that hearing that one develop within the heart, one develops some real genuine affection, some kind of love, right? And when one feels that love, then all of those, the pride, the lust, the greed, in, in kind of like in one, you know, what do they say? One fell swoop, <laughs> right? One fell swoop. Is it foul? Uh, or fell. Fell. Is it fell? Foul. Is it, fell? Foul. Is it one foul swoop? It's not a f- I don't think it's foul. <laughs> one fell swoop. It's not a foul swoop. What does that mean, fell? One fell swoop. Like, like it's fell, like it came down. One swoop that comes down, I guess, something like that. I don't know. One <laughs> fell one swoop. Fell swoop. Like British. It must be British. <laughs> I don't know. One but fell one swoop. Fell, one fell. What's swoop? a swoop? <laughs> I don't know what a swoop is. It's, it's swoop. Where else do you use the word swoop? Is that the only place it's ever used? I think it's been used. Otherwise. Oh, I swooped down or I swooped. Like a bird that's swoops a, down, right? 
who, you know. So in any case, okay. in right. one swoop, we use it twice. In one fell <laughs> swoop, you know, but through love, through that connection, you you let go of your pride, you let yeah. go of your lust, you let go. So so that gyanic approach, that and that type of analysis, it's helpful in bhakti yoga, and it can be applied, you know, in bhakti yoga. It's a lot of what we do here, you know, gyana helps it, but. But also there's, especially in bhakti yoga, the idea is that if I just, if my heart just becomes attracted to God, automatically all of those low, lower qualities diminish. On a side note, they're saying it's Shakespeare, one fell swoop. Okay. How many times do we quote Shakespeare and not even realize it? Isn't that amazing? Um, you know, I was thinking like in the container of bhakti, we're hearing truth on a regular basis. So all the stuff that it comes to us anyway, the loss of a child, the loss of your home, the loss of your, uh, the loss of your youth, the loss of your hair, the loss of all these things that we lose when we're, when, when they're thrown upon or when they come down upon us in one fell swoop, like I lost my hair, I'm losing my hair. I remember the first time I was, I had a convertible and my wife was driving behind me in another car when we were dating and she was like on the phone talking to me. She's like, you know, you're going bald, right? I can see you like, ahead of me. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not going bald. I'm not going bald here. She's like, no, you're definitely going bald. I can see it, right? Like, you're totally going bald here. And I was like, I'm not going bald. It was like, it's like the material world dismantles your ego, whether you like it or not. So the Shastra or the sacred literature, the wisdom literature teach it. Get From the get-go, you should understand, it's not your hair, man. You're not the hair. You're not the body. That's, that's not you. Don't take shelter of it as your security, as your, as your anchor. It's not an anchor. Find something more subtle, more solid. What's more solid? It's interesting. Krishna is more solid, but he's more subtle. And that's what we're sort of getting goaded towards, the subtle solid. Ooh, I like that. The subtle solid. You know, and, and so therefore, when we go through these reversals, these hairpin turns, these black ice of the material world where you're just sliding all over the place, we got something solid and subtle to hold on to. And we've been hearing it. We've been hearing it the whole time from the get go, from our first class, from our good morning. <laughs> Ian told the story. That was our good morning class today. It wasn't like, hey, it's going to be a great day. Everybody look with the bright side. It was sort of like, dun, 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 dun. It was like a sort of like a very heavy story to hear at 5 a.m. But there's a, there's a beautiful, um, you know, you could tease that out into his whole spiritual life and this baby's spiritual journey. This baby, if you think about um, Sri Govinda's child, what, no, what a fortunate birth, you know? He gets born into a family of a, of a guy that likes kirtan. And that will play this person Kirtan every day till he leaves his body. Couldn't, wouldn't, how great would that be if my life was like that? That is like the perfection of life for that child. You know, there's always going to be sadness. There's always going to be loss. I'm going to, I'm going to have to leave my body. But if Kostuba's by my side, chanting in my ear, my life is perfect. My life is perfect. What do you think about that, Kostuba? No, oh, just come on over and I'll chant in your ear for you anytime. <laughs> chant in my ear. Will you chant in my ear while I'm dying? I, I, if I'm still If I go first. Be, I'd be honored. <laughs> I'd be honored. Yeah, so pride, you know. Um, I, I think sometimes um, it's a little confusing because, like, it, it, does it have something to do with, like, a loss of self-esteem or something like that? But I, th I think we can just understand it as it's kind of like relishing the feeling of being superior to others, right? That, again, the you, illusion you know, that that's an incredible discussion, right? Go ahead. Uh, you know, as I was saying, like the material world starts to dismantle the things you're pride, proud of. Yeah. But there's also the practices of bhakti that sort of dismantle them as well. You know, um, I don't know if you ever, did you ever do Dandavat Prakram? I mean, of where? Of where? I've done, I've done. I don't know. Radha Kund. Where do you do I've done it? Of the little Govardhan of, you know, in, in the Yukov. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I've done it at Radha Kund. I think we, at Radha Kund, it's sort of like yeah, Dandava Prikram, if you don't know. Dandava is when you fall down, you bow down, fully prostrated. What's that? We did it. Hannah Hersko's here. She did it too. 
Oh, so wow. It's like, oh, so we, yeah, and we did it at the Govardhan Echo Village. And when you do it at Radhakund, now Radhakund is like a village. So I was all excited to do it once. And it was just sort of like, you know, hey, I'm going to do it. It's sort of like exciting. It's venture. It's like physical. It's, it's like deep physical. It's like full contact prayer, <laughs> if there's such a thing. But you're in like a crowded village. And in a the village, there's people walking around, people shopping. Somebody's getting their hair cut. Somebody's like, you know, sh- uh, having lunch. You know, there's a, a motor car driving by. And plus, there's all the wild animals of the village. A pig, a monkey, a dog, a stray dog with his, like, missing on two legs. It's just like everything is like India, full-blown, overwhelming sense, sense overwhelm. And so when I got there, the first time I ever did it, you get a little stone and you bow down and you put that stone down. But I remember the first time I was like all excited. And then I was like, I'm going to lay down on this street. And it was like, my ego is there. I was like, what's this guy going to think of me? What's this guy? Gonna-? I mean, they do people do that every day. And I'm still thinking, what are they going to think of me? It's like the biggest burden most of us carry is what is that person going to think of me? You know what I mean? I think being a punk Kostuba, you don't relate to that very much because our punk scene, we, we got over that at a young age, but it still like lingers. What are they going to think? And then all even, of a sudden, I'm le- go on. I was going to say, even in the punk thing, it's like you just narrow down the group of people that you're concerned who thinks how they think about you, right? Right. There, there's still a group. There's still a group that you want to like give you accolades or something. But I remember the first time I laid down on that street and there's like a dribble of drain water or something. I was like, oh, there goes my shirt. It's like, I'm going to burn this shirt after that. And then, you know, and then there's a dog and the dog was a little gross. It wasn't like a normal, healthy Colombian or American dog. It was like a sickly dog. And I was like, oh, please, dog, go away from me. Please, dog, go away from me. And you're bowing down and praying. Get up and do it again and get up. The, I tell you, it was like I was challenged. You, you, it was like God was saying to me, you really want to do this? Okay. There was a kid at a barber shop, and they were just throwing the hair out. And I was like, I got to go through this hair. I got to go through this child's hair. And I was like, all right, whatever. It was like getting grosser <laughs> and grosser. And then it started getting mixed in with the elements of danger. Because as on the, on the, on the roadway, there was like, 36 monkeys and they wouldn't move. And I was like, I'm going into a pack of monkeys right now. And I'm just like bowing down, getting up, bowing down, getting up. And most of them sort of scattered except one. And he was missing a hand and he had like a jagged fang out of his mouth. He obviously was a tough, toughest of all the monkeys. And I was like, all right, man, it's you and me. But I'm. <laughs> it was like the whole thing was like whatever pride I came there with started to get like ripped away, humiliated. And then, you know, the people, it was like actually a very, one of the, my magical experience. I'm going to write about this. It was like a very magical experience because people started coming through the streets and chanting and people were on prick room and they were like, you know, sometimes they see you and they cheer you on. Ever get those people that sort of cheer you on? And it sort of like really inspired me. And then I just like kept on going with it. I was just like, yes, yes. That's a, that gross dog is actually a sacred dog. And that gnarly monkey is a sacred monkey. And those are, and these people are special people. And they're here in this special town, just chanting and hearing and singing and, you know, making Prashad. And that's a that's sacred hair. And from then on, I got like, it took me like three quarters of the way to make it through. But this whole practice cracks pride. And underneath that pride that I think is going to give me some pleasure, there's something very like beautiful. And I think this is like the big part of the process. It's like the cracking of the macadamia nut to get that incredible nut. Macadamia is like the king of nuts. I might be the king of nuts, but <laughs> macadamia nuts, they say, are the king of nuts, and they're very difficult to open. You need like a special nutcracker to get them open. And underneath us is this beautiful spirit soul. Mm. Yeah. Was your, was your, was your, uh, of a prick room as dramatic as that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was similar, you know? It, it is true. It, it's it's a fascinating process where you're lying down. I mean, I don't know the exact distance or exactly how long it took us, but uh, you know, it's a good distance where you're down there on the ground and you get up. It, it's physically exhausting, you know. Physically exhausting. Yeah. So you're getting up. Full you're contact down, prayer. You're getting up. You're lying down. You're getting up. You're lying down. Going over this distance. Uh, so, but it is interesting how yeah, the physical and the external kind of affects the internal, and and you do kind of. Um, let go. Of, you know the the 
the, the process, we, we mentioned uh, last week, we talked about regularity, doing things over and over again. And, you know, like, for instance, with chanting, you know, chanting rounds, whatever. But when we speak, you know, it's mentioned that the, what was it, Shanka Purvakam, that, that the, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, these greatest of sadhus, you know, these great bhakti yogis, uh, great teachers of bhakti, that, that they would um, count uh, do the do these regular regular you know regulated activities, you know, uh, and count them, uh, Shankar mm. Purvaka, you know. So not only were they chanting the mantras that they're you know counting the mantras that they're chanting, they were all there. I think who was it? Was it Raghunath Tasko Swami who was uh, maybe Raghunath Tasko? They they were they were they had a certain number of times where they would offer obeisances to the great to the great souls like every day, right? Like, I bow down, get up, bow down, every get day up. Yeah, I'm going to bow down to like, you know, in, in my mind and in my heart and with my body. It's like I'll, spiritual CrossFit. You're down. like up and down and bow again. It's a yeah. push. It's like burpees, <laughs> spiritual burpees. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, and even if, I mean, of course, it helps to do it externally, but even if it's just internally, you know, that, that I'm going to, how will I engage my mind? I'm going to engage my mind in deeply appreciating the beautiful qualities of these, of these other yogis. And in this way, my mind becomes purified. So mm -hmm. I, I think on that prikrama, it, you know, it's it's taking the physical, and it's engaging in such a way where the where the mental and the internal become transformed and purified like that. And it, and it's it's a it's a wonderful experience. I think you know you take you take everyone doing that around uh, the little Govardhan Hill at the Govardhan Eco Village. It's a nice sandy path, and you go around, and yeah. I think people always feel exhilarated after it. Yeah, we got to make it more authentic. We got to get some real children's hair on the path. <laughs> okay, well, we'll to make it to get it to get it real. I'll to talk, be a one-legged dog. I'll talk to Garanga for if he can spread a little <laughs> around there. But I will say that something I think for me, um, at least with my like constitution, doing something physical helps me connect to the spiritual. It does. You know, because um, uh, you, you you can't. I'm. I, no, because I, I can't wander. You got to just be focused. You got to even sit there and chant Japa. Difficult, difficult. But to like chanting, chanting while I'm like going up and down like that, it just it helps me uh, control the mind because there's nowhere else I can go really. Mm. You got to get focused. Well, uh, let's look at these right. three types of pride briefly. You know, why don't we do that? And we have sure. twelve minutes left or so. So, what was your acronym again? Was it WEF? WEF. <laughs> wealth, it worked. Wealth, education, and followers. Right. Yeah. The, the idea, right, that the idea that my happiness comes through relishing a feeling of superiority due to one of these, because I have more wealth than another person, right, because I have more followers than another person, because I, what was the other one? Because I have more, greater education. It's, it's, mm. it's very, you know, they say that the, 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 I don't know, maybe this is Shakespeare, that the pauper is proud of his penny. You've heard that before? The pauper is, yeah. Right. In other words, yeah. even the pauper is proud of his wealth. <laughs> you know? Right. It, it's, it's, it's just like, um, it's, there's not even any real, in one sense, there's almost no logic to it except the fact that we will take, that we'll grab and take pride of something. We'll, we will try to establish ourselves as superior in some way or another and try to relish the taste of that, you know, mm. where we see that the happiness, the, 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 again, the real happiness comes only when we let go of that. So like we say, people feel exhilarated after going on the Govardhan Prikrama. It's a, it's a big, long, physical and mental exercise in humility. You know, that I am not greater than anyone. You know, I am just, you know, th that feeling, you know, even that, even that phrase may sound, um, you know, abrasive to, to many ears and minds, you know, to embrace the idea, I'm not greater than anyone. You know, but, but there's, mm. but, but the deepest spiritual happiness comes when we're not trying to, to grab on to, to pride and establishing ourselves as better than anyone because we are pure spirit. We are, you know, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am, I am, my very identity, when you peel off the different layers, the bodily layers, the mental layers, all, all of the temporary um, things that I identify with, whether it be my education or my wealth or my followers or my country 
you know, or my family, or w whatever it may be. Once those are all peeled away, and I can even do that while in them, but once I'm, in, once I'm really experiencing my own nature, who I am, and that's what yoga is really all about, once I'm experiencing that, I'm experiencing kind of satisf a, a kind of satisfaction that's way beyond. The, the, the happiness that we get from that sense of pride, that feeling that, that we want to relish through pride, mm. it will seem not only puny, but it'll actually seem like suffering, right? Like that I was, mm. in, you know, that I, I was clinging on to these paltry ideas as a form of happiness. Where was I? You know, we need to come to that place. We need to pray to come to that place. We need to endeavor to come to that place of realization. Well, it's uh, two of the, two of the three of those things are really sort of obvious. The um, um, if you just analyze it, people can lose their wealth in a moment. Yeah, there's like hyperinflation. The the currency crashes. Some you know change of dictators or something like that. Or people can lose or or just the whatever it be. People you know the stock market. Everything drops and you can lose everything. And all of a sudden, what I was really proud of is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And I was investing me in that like that was me. Right. And now what am I without that? Like, what is my identity? People lost their lots of people are lost, have lost and will lose their businesses, their jobs, etc. And they're trying to and part of it is like, what am I without that job? And um, it's a huge tragic thing that if you're practicing a spiritual path, will goad. I use this word a lot. Goad. Okay. Is that a popular word or is it just like a Harry Krishna word, goading? It's, 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 everybody, does it. everybody say goad? Does everybody say goad? I don't know if everybody says it, but it's used. One person actually saying no, nobody says it. And Sherry's like, yes. <laughs> Sherry, you've been hanging out with the Harry Krishnas too long. because you. She's like, yeah, I say goad every day. <laughs> okay, anyway, I mean, go, you get goaded towards like, I have even lost my train of thought with that. What was I talking about? <laughs> oh, if you lose things, in the material world, you think I'm losing, I'm losing my identity. But as when you're practicing bhakti, you get goaded towards, well, that wasn't mine anyway. Right. And so wealth is a really easy one to understand. F popularity or followers or people that give you a lot of respect. I mean, nowadays too, we see people in the news, in cancel culture, people get, you know, they, sh sh they, they had this great respect and all of a sudden they're like the, either a laughing stock or they're humiliated or did some shame shameful thing. Um, I always tell the story of like either like O.J. Simpson. I grew up a fan of O.J. Simpson. The whole world did. And all of a sudden he's like public enemy number one. He's like on the most wanted list. Or you have someone like Bill Cosby and you, you, people can lose everything they had or a great rock star. What's a famous prominent? What's a famous rock person that lost all their fame? And don't say shelter. <laughs> 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 The singer, what's the, the singer of Motley Crue? What's he doing now? Hmm. He's a little out of shape. Oh, he's got a reality show. Well, it's still a show. Van Halen, no, David Lee Roth. That's humiliating. Right? That. <laughs> that's humiliating. Well, that's why I'm, well, I'm just saying you had all this th stuff and then you've lost all this stuff. All right. But here's my question. What about intelligence? People are very intelligent. They get very proud of their intelligence. How does the material world dismantle a person's intelligence? Well, or does it? I mean, one way or another, you know, there's always someone more intelligent. And, you know, here specifically, I think it's, it's um, yeah. when we say education is talking about your learning or something like that. But, you know, ultimately that gets taken away at death too. But the value of it or what you can gain through it or something like that, you know, is, is, is relative, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Jennifer says dementia. You people lose their intelligence. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? There we go. <laughs> yeah, you lose your memory. You yeah, know. or... Um, Just someone else comes along, you know. Or your intelligence theory. maybe isn't serving your material desires. Like, mm -hmm. you might be really intelligent, but people don't like you. Or you might be intelligent, but you can't get your attractive mate, or you can't make money. There's a lot of intelligent people that can't make money, or, the, you know, that yeah. could be frustrating as well. So the idea of taking shelter of the intelligence as a type of pride it gets dismantled somehow or another, you, you know, even part at the of very last. The question that you asked me earlier is like, do we try to dismantle all of these separately? Um, or, or is there right. another way in the one fell swoop? Well, in one sense, the one fell swoop means it, it means that it's a, it's another conception, right? It's another formula for happiness in life. You know, the, 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 
maybe the materially intuitive formula for happiness is I am this body, I am this mind, let me search out and attain, you know, obtain those resources which satisfy the body and the mind. Um, but this formula, this, this yogic formula, specifically this bhakti formula, is that happiness is my true nature. I'm out of touch with it. I need to, I need to you know, become free of the bondage of my mind and senses and reconnect with my divine source, or to reconnect with God to experience that true nature, which is always there and just needs to be uncovered. And so when one begins to think like that, then the process, the, the one fell swoop, the one process, is I engage everything that I have in that reconnection, in that service. So therefore, my intelligence, like you brought up the point of intelligence, I have a certain amount of intelligence. It may be great, it may be not so great, but in either case, no matter how much it is, I can engage it in the service of God and in the service of humanity, right? My strength, my wealth, you know, what is it? Wealth, my fo if I have followers, I can engage my followers, you know, but they're not mm. my followers. That's the way a, a real guru thinks, you know, and that's, that's where you get in that messy guru stuff when the guru starts to think these are my followers, you know? A true guru right. <laughs> is like, these are my followers, you know, if I play any role here, it's just engage them, reconnect them with God. So with that one fell swoop that everything I have, my body, my words, my mind, my wealth, my family, my, my you know, my abilities, whatever I have, I make it within one fell swoop, I make that an offering. I use that not to serve, not to build up my pride, but to, I engage it in the service of God and without any pride and I feel happiness. That's the real formula for happiness. Yeah. It's a little early. You, you cutting out on us early? One foul swoop, sir. That's going to be our saying of the day. Huh. Kostiba G. Robert you've G. done it again. You too. Thanks to Shrigo Vinda. What, I, I miss him. You know, I, especially seeing you all over there. I'm really feeling, you know, missing uh, Shrigo Vinda and Sham Sundari and everybody over there. Land of tropical fruits here. He's living the life. Jersey City's over. He's just walking around, riding that horse around. There's a peacock they ride here. They just ride on that peacock, flies them around to their room. They don't even walk anymore. They're just flying peacocks around. Have you gotten to Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks for the Kali Columbia crew here. Oh, yeah, look at these people here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's joining us on uh, Patreon. We're on a Sweet Baby Krishna marathon every day. Sweet Baby Krishna. Seven, what time do we do it? 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're not a Patreon member and you like to, if you like what we're doing on the show, you want to support us, you go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages, and we will give you the secret codes to enter into our Sweet Baby Krishna club. Then you can enter. Hey, you know group, what uh, Mary Sweet told group us last yesterday? night, and today we're going to talk about What's that? You know what Mara told us yesterday? I couldn't hear you, Kostub. Say again. You know what Mara told us what? yesterday? That we have 999... What? I'm, and I'm saying what? Now I'm saying what? We have 999 patrons. Oh, we have 999 yesterday. patrons. So if you're not a patron, you can be Mr. or Mrs. 1000. <laughs> and then you got that going for you. <laughs> but we, we have to thank all those Thanks, patrons. Everybody. That's amazing. It's really wonderful. We're very grateful to all of you. Come on, you guys. Look alive. It's... Yeah.